Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Thank you for joining the Dope Vision Experience podcast. And this week I'm coming to you with a special guest, uh, Sonya B. She's going to be kind of hosting with me today and kind of talking about a couple of various topics. Uh, Sonya, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everybody, my name is Sonya B, aka Curly SB on Instagram and Twitter. Um, yeah, I'm I'm here. I'm ready. Let's talk. Let's let's get into it. Do it. So this man, one of my um, probably one of the things I've been wanting to do. I, I met her back when we were doing the trap open open mic trap art. We was talking, and she was doing a little bit of the leading of the conversations. We had a panel. It was probably about 15, 20 of us. So I couldn't really get to know her one on one. I've shot her a couple of times in a couple of uh, fashion shows, but we never actually had the opportunity to talk one on one. And so uh, at putting out the podcast a couple of weeks in a row, you know, reached out talk to her she said absolutely I, i'm down for the come on so now we have her in so we're going to talk about dig deep into some of her questions that she might not want to answer but we're going to see if we can dig a little deep and see if we can get something out of her so what have you been doing for this quarantine have you been working out what, what kind of things that you've been up to since since the quarantine kind of took off i think like everyone else we've kind of hit like a wave of like this this Either you're productive or you're like, I'm just trying to survive, you know. Um, but I think in the beginning, it was really just adjusting to the new norm and um, not, well, no, I think moreover in the beginning, it was just like understanding the magnitude, you know, um, trying to understand what the media was putting out there, whether it was being grandized, was this like conspiracy, is this really happening, you know, in America and all over the world, you know, so it was really just trying to get a grip on reality and what was, you know, preparing yourself, uh, people running, you know, all over the place. Um, sorry, I'm in the right now. Um, so throughout the, throughout the quarantine, I found myself kind of just, um, taking a moment I mean in the beginning it was like okay the money situation like all right figuring out you know um, how to survive and then the employment thing hit and I was like okay like something you know the stimulus or whatever and after a while I kind of just um I needed to ground myself so I've been doing a lot of meditation I'm doing a, I've been doing a lot of like yoga just trying to stay active you know I'll go for a walk around my block or I'll go Know, work out with one of my close friends in her garage you know um i've done painting i've read multiple books you know audio books i'm just trying to like keep keep up you know like regardless if the world is kind of stopped right now i don't want that to necessarily stop me you know um physically mentally spiritually you know all that just kind of trying to stay yeah and on that I've been kind of doing the same thing. I've been using this opportunity to actually learn new skills, come up with new ideas, get get more creative. Because normally when we were going day to day, we were just day to day routine, Monday through Friday, come the weekend, you're kind of trying to get excited for the weekend, then come back Monday through Friday again. It's, it's weekend, week out, day in, day out, you're kind of on the same, also the same ground. So some of the things that you kind of wanted to do, you didn't get the opportunity to do it because you, you couldn't find the time or you just didn't make the time. So now the quarantine has been a blessing in disguise. So it's actually given us the opportunity to tackle some of those things that we didn't have the opportunity to tackle, read some of those books we haven't had the opportunity to read. So what kind of, what's to say you read a couple of books, what kind of books were you reading? Well, since you've been out I'm really into self-development books um, most recently though I was um, I was referenced this book it's called Outwitting the Devil and it's by Napoleon Hill uh, that was a very interesting read my dad actually gave me another book um, by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich I'll read that. And, um, so I have that ironically enough my dad gave me the book and he's like don't take it if you're not gonna read it and I was like I'm gonna read it and I never got around to reading <laughs> but there was this other book, you know, Outwitting the Devil, and a friend of mine was like, yeah, you know, you like this book, then read this one, and so I checked that one out, and um, honestly, it, it helps to add perspective to your life, so much so that it, it, it shifts narrative that we live by, you know, um, it expands your mind, and just makes you see the world in a different light, it'll take away certain fears that you might have, or, you know, limitations that you put on yourself, you know, so, um, once upon a time I heard if you wanted to hide something good like put it in the book yep. you know? and 
it's crazy growing up I was a great student it's just I didn't read like that I could read as far as like popcorn reading you know I could read the whole with with charisma too you know so it's not the issue that I can't read it's just I never had the patience to sit there long enough <laughs> to read a book you know so I turned to to um, audiobooks and audible that really helped me out until I could get to that point of consciousness and awareness yeah I've been having this uh, yin and yang tug and pull when it comes to the audio books because I'm more of an old school reader. I like to flip the pages and fold back the pages when I get stuck on a book or put a bookmarker in the book and kind of reminisce and kind of go back. But with the audio books, I couldn't really get into them. I tried to listen to one and then I'll listen to it and I'll stop it and try to start back. And it just doesn't kind of, it doesn't resonate enough with me as if I was reading because I feel like I can comprehend it a little bit more. And I could be just old school with it a little. A couple of my friends, they tell me they, you know, kind of blow through the audio books a little bit faster. But I, I feel like when I read the book, I can retain the information a little bit more than when I hear it. But it's on the flip side, when I listen to podcasts, I kind of retain the information a lot easier when I listen to podcasts because that gives me, I say, oh, I take it down. When I'm listening to it, I actually open up my phone, I make a note of something. So then when I actually finish watching this, when I finish listening to the podcast, I can go and research it and look at it and look it up and kind of get a little bit more of the tidbit. But when it comes to the audio books, I just haven't gotten to it yet. I might try it. I might have to get back on it. If somebody can give me a great recommendation on the book to try, I might just do that and see if I can just get through it. Because, you know, sometimes it, it could be just the person who's reading the book too. I think that could be a big issue too. Some of the books I've read that I didn't quite get into the person who was actually doing the audio portion of it. So it kind of made me not as interested. Uh, because when I'm actually reading a book, my imagination takes off. So I'm, I'm picturing what the people are writing and the scenarios that they're putting in, and, and especially some of those like the Napoleon Hill books or some of those other uh, those those books like that with self development. It kind of give you scenarios and what people were doing and some of the, and then you can kind of envision it in your mind what they were, what they were, what they were doing or what you're trying what they're trying to get you to see. So that's why I've been a little bit more into the, the old school reading and turning pages. I might just be a old fossil, but they're just one of my things. And like you said, you know beginning I wasn't a big avid reader you know I read magazines I read articles and different things like that but now in the age of social media we have to be able to go and do the research ourselves because you'll hear something and because a lot of people are living through memes and depending on where those memes come from nobody ever really knows where the memes come from you just see the meme on your, on your timeline and you're like oh I kind of relate to that but you don't know who's funneling it to you so you have to take that for, as, with a grain of salt and take that and then go and do a you know a leg further and go do your research try to get some credible sources and things like that so when you've been saying you've been at home and exercise with your friend what kind of exercises have you been doing have you been doing like more running more cardio um, kind of a little lifting weights or what, what have you been doing what you been up to oh man uh, me personally, I don't do too much cardio or running because I'm already slim, so I'm trying to like bulk up, you know what I mean? Um, usually whenever I'm at home, I will do something with a resistance band or stretching, um, yoga. Like I said, I'll go on a run around my block just to kind of keep my, my body warm. Um, but when I go to my friend's house, you know, she and her boyfriend are like fitness dudes, you know, they got the whole setup in their garage, so we go ham in there. She is just as petite as I am, but she be lifting, like, you know, and so she's, she's definitely like my, uh, my little personal trainer. That's, that's essentially like the scope of what I'm doing. Like we'll do, we'll target certain areas in our body. We'll do weights. A lot of it is weight lifting, um, you know, just core strength. Whenever I go with her, it's usually uh, weight lifting. And me personally, you know, before, mm -hmm. before the virus and before the pandemic, I would go and work out here and there, but with the kids, I just couldn't find the time. It's like, I'll work out for three or four months straight and kind of go, you know, three or four days out of the week. And then something will happen, you miss a day here, you miss another day, that turns into a week, that turns into two weeks, and then you just kind of fall off. And then the pandemic hit, and I'm like, I'm not going out there and work out. I don't like, I'm like you, I don't like to run. And I mostly like to like lift like weights. So I try to stay, you know, try to stay stronger, but I've been trying to, talk myself into doing more like in-home workouts because you see all the people posting their workouts and doing push-ups and I'm just like the end of the world's here I'm, oh, no. I'm just not finna start no push-ups right now I'm just, it's just not in my it's just not in my thing but I, I kind of get out with the kids they kind of make me run around so I take the kids out to the park you know I let them run around I run with them so I can get some type of cardio um I went to the 
Half Moon Bay last week. We got out and I ran with the kite, so that kind of gives me some some exercise. I can run like that as far as like I'm active and doing things like that, but as far as like, oh, I'm gonna go and run two miles, it's just not my thing I'm not <laughs> at all, I'm not at all. And uh, with this pandemic, um, I see that a lot of, you know, a lot of the other states are a little bit further ahead of us and they're opening back up. You know, we're still on maybe 72, 73 days of being locked down. They kind of start opening up a little bit. But as you've been seeing some of the, the other states open up and seeing some of the people out and about, what have been your thoughts and your concerns on some of the parties that's been going on? How do you feel about that? I feel a plethora of ways. <laughs> um, I feel like we can really navigate around society if we were just a more careful people you know um there's certain guidelines i think honestly the, the most disturbing thing is the the people who are quote unquote exercising their right to not wear masks but i think essentially it's just like okay granted you don't have to like it's just take care of other people you know it, it's compassion for others like okay you don't you're not sick, but the other, like other people are, you know, it's just having a certain compassion and a level of intelligence. I mean, it is what it is, but just the fact that I'm seeing people fighting over the fact that they don't want to wear a mask, like it's not going to harm you, you know, just put the mask on, <laughs> you know, that, that's just how I feel about it. But and I just, know, that's my part, I, I was never one of the people who didn't already purchase, you know, soap and hand sanitizer, like I've already been Clean yeah, and I, and I ride the border because I work in the city, so I ride the border every day. So I'm always washing my hands and trying to stay clean as much as possible. And with the comes with the mask, I, I just like I said, I think it's just a lack of information of people wanting to know because they feel like they're younger or they it's not it's not them or it's nobody in their family, so they just feel like oh I don't have to wear a mask. But it's not just you; it's your family member, it's that cousin or it's that aunt or it's that grandparent that could possibly get sick just because you're younger and the way that they was telling us in the beginning, because there's been a lot of mixed information that was been going out. So they've been telling us in the beginning. So, hey, you can have the virus for two weeks and you don't even know. It. So if you have it for two weeks, imagine how many people you come in contact with, your auntie, you know, your cousin. And like, uh, I'm from Mississippi, so I hear stories because um, in a smaller town like Mississippi and Cleveland, um, there have been opportunities where the city, some of the state didn't shut down as fast and some of it probably was shutting down, but not as fast. So you had um, some of the older people who were some of the smaller towns, they were affected heavily because you have these, you know, young adults, teenagers, they're going out and they're still partying and they're still moving around. And then this person who's been in the house who's 85 or 90 years old, they don't go anywhere. And you come in, you try to take care of them or you bring them something, you just come in and out of the house. You know, you know how you know how you go with your grandparents or you just go, go in and go out. And next thing you know, that person's sick and they're fighting for their life and the immune system is strong. So, you know, me just seeing these parties and things like that, I just think it's kind of somewhat irresponsible. I know we have to at some point get back out there Life is not going to be the same, but we, we have to get back there. And we're getting out there as fast. I think that's where we kind of have to, you know, take heed to the science part of it. And so when, when it comes down to that, that's where my breakup, that's, that's where my hangup is. I know, I know we need to get out there. It's going to be probably with us forever. There's no cure at the moment, but I just want us to be able to, you know, take care of the people who possibly can't take care of themselves. I know somebody like us who are a little bit younger, our immune system is probably stronger. Kids, they can kind of, maybe two weeks, three weeks, they can kind of fight it off. But someone who's a little bit older, they don't have, they don't have that chance or opportunity to fight it off. And when it comes to that, um, how do you feel about not being able to move around as freely as you once was? I know people were upset about not being able to go out and go to the gyms. How do you feel about not being able to move around? Oh man, you know, I've I've been asked, you know, like where's the first place you want to go when quarantine is over? And to be honest with you, I was such an introvert beforehand. It's like really, <laughs> I would I would be a homebody, you know. But now that it's like, okay, you can't go because places are closed, you know. And and I think even after this, people are still going to be very uh, reluctant to being within close proximity to other people for fear of contacting something. Contacting um, how do I feel about not being able to go anywhere? I, it's really just an adjustment. I feel like I'm I'm sitting back and I'm watching the world unravel. And it's almost like, you know, these prophecies or these, these you know, old movies 
like I have conspiracy like oh like it all of it just sounds I, I for lack of a better term I guess uh, I don't even know how to describe it honestly it just sucks it sucks not to be able to go out <laughs> you know but again it's like I feel like I'm sitting back and I'm watching the world fall exactly to where I knew or based on these movies like my dad had me watch this movie called Idiocracy and he said you know this movie was meant to be a comedy when you first watch it it's funny you know it's supposed to have a lot of humor but if you really think about it this is America you know this is how this is gonna go and essentially it's just like the demise of the human race and as far as intelligence and stuff goes and it's just like it's crazy because what we think is common knowledge or common courtesy uh common sense you know is really not that common Absolutely. So. I agree. And like this pandemic has really been showing me, I know I've talked about it previously in some of my previous episodes, that our government is not together as much as they try to appear to be. You know, every governor is kind of doing what they want to do. This governor is doing this, this governor is doing that, the president's saying this, um, this governor's over there doing that. So we go, we were pretty much the first state to kind of go on lockdown, and then other states kind of went after us. And then it's crazy how other states are opening up before us when we were the we were the first ones to kind of shut down. So they're like, playing, they're, I'm pretty sure they're playing with the numbers to try to make you feel like, okay, the numbers are not as bad as it seems. So what we're gonna do is we're probably gonna fudge the numbers to make you feel safe enough. Like, oh, we're gonna do 14 days worth decline of the numbers. So therefore we can start by opening up where some of the information is starting to come out now that there are places that the numbers weren't where they should have been and they open up too soon. Like in the state of Alabama, they pretty much never shut down. So now they are having issues where they're being overflooded with the hospitals and with the state like that, where they don't have a lot of income, it's already hard enough to get the hospitals and get the right materials that they need. Now that they're being you know, full and overpacked, because I saw that the mayor basically said, hey, if you come to the hospital, there's really no room for you here in Montgomery. So we have to try to stay self quarantine. So I feel like we're just not doing the right things. We're not being, we're not um, doing it as one. So if we were all have one goal, one vision, we could possibly get through this thing together. But if you're opening up sooner and then the travel is gonna start happening, people are gonna start really, you've been, now you've been locked down for two months you kind of eased up on certain parts of the country and now people are starting to travel. So that's basically gonna just repopulate different areas that probably didn't have people who were sick at some point. So at the end of the day, it's still gonna be some people getting sick and some people are gonna pass away unfortunately from this, but we just have to you know, continue to stay positive, keep doing your, your daily routines, keep eating your fruit and getting your, getting your immune system as strong as possible. And on that note, I know that some places like New York on certain parts of the town they're beating us, beating us over the head for not wearing masks. And then on other parts of town, they're handing, out, they're handing out masks and they're making circles in the park. So it make sure you stay six feet. So when it comes to those type of dynamics, where do you, where do you see us and how do you think we should handle this? I really wish I had the answer for that. I mean, our own government is kind of scrambling and they're all fighting over what should happen, what shouldn't happen, you know, so. I, I wish I had the answer for that, uh, but I th- you you kind of hit on something that I was paying the most attention to in the beginning of it all is trying to make sure that you're you're healthy. You know what I'm saying? Building up your immune system. Like, granted, this is a, a I guess easily contractable you know virus, but at the end of the day, like so long as you prepare yourself. I mean, yes, the the gloves, you know, the masks, the hand sanitizers, but essentially it's your system, it's your your body, you know. And um, really, if I could push any other message out, I would definitely be, you know, wanting to tell the people to make sure you're taking care of your body. You know, watch what you're eating. You know, I'm not not gonna say drop everything and become vegan, you know, immediately, but it's like, take the steps, you know what I mean? Learn about your body and be conscious about the things that you're putting into your body try a super you know super food you know like mushrooms but they're very you know high in nutrition and just you know uh, ginger you know drinking um some ginger and lemon in your water you know what i'm saying early in the morning like that'll really boost your immune system and help to fight off these certain viruses so i think it's very important to you know be careful and all that stuff um just you know be, be aware of the things that you're putting into your body first yeah, and I think, I, go ahead. I, I just think that just goes back to our 
uh, previous generations where they were getting the foods that they could they, they would they were getting the, they were getting the foods whatever they can get their hands on so they would that's what they were eating so that's what they knew to eat so that's what they taught us to eat so it's almost like it's been ingrained in us and it's, and it's in our DNA to go and eat the fried chickens and all the unhealthy foods that we're not that we shouldn't be eating that we're now learning that we should eat so it's all it's in our DNA so it's hard to kind of pull back so now you have to unlearn those things that you used to do and then learning new things that you're trying to gain get new accustomed to eating more of your bananas and your apples and your strawberries and your blueberries for cancer and things like that to fight cancer off. and so and also there are certain places there in the country that have like food there's where you don't have the opportunity to get those type of things or where now um, a, a thing of strawberry a bush of strawberries probably costs more than a burger so you can get a, a filling a filling meal for four dollars or five dollars but it's going to cost you five fifty to six dollars just for a thing of, thing of strawberries so if i was somebody who was on the borderline of do i eat strawberries or do i eat this meal and i still have a couple of dollars left over for the next day so that i can make sure that i eat because when we hit the pandemic you know it pretty much showed the country that we're a paycheck just like the country the country is a paycheck away from being broke just like everybody else you don't get any money going through your through your accounts in a couple of weeks you know a couple of paychecks and things can go sideways really quickly and the country and this pandemic has actually showed us that so when things are going sideways you it's just preservation so what do i do first do i do i go get all this fresh fruit or do i get food that's going to last that i can make sure that i can eat so i think that's when those things type those type of things happen to us so therefore when those checks weren't coming as fast enough people were really like on the edge of hey i need to get something now I'm not thinking about fruit. So that's when your immune system get low. Also your immune system is gonna get lower as well because we're all sheltered in place because our body is normally nat naturally actively fighting germs every single day. Like I said, like you're out touching things and your, your body is naturally fighting it off for you. But now that we've been in the house for two or three months, your body's gonna be reacting to the outside and now your immune system is a little bit lower. So the next first time you touch something, you could possibly get sick. So, you know, like I said, just eating those right fruits and staying healthy and on that topic, when we we're talking about the world in general, have you had an opportunity to see what happened in Minnesota yesterday? Did you see that? How could you miss it? Yeah, it, it was. It's unfortunate. It, it shouldn't be happening. Still, it hurts my heart, and I, I've been having, I've been emotionally roller coaster. Sometimes I didn't actually almost didn't want to do the podcast because I try not to do anything publicly speaking for at least twenty four to forty hours because you're so angry and you can just say and just spill out negative things and you have to have an opportunity to process it. So after processing it after 24 hours, how do you feel about what happened and what can we do to move forward? What should we do now? What 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 should we do in your opinion? These are some tough questions, oh my gosh. Um... country's flawed it's it always has been and I'm gonna try not to get emotional because I do have you know black brothers and, and cousins and friends and you know it's just the amount of hate that people have in their hearts you know it it's just so unbelievable like I, I cannot fathom you know as a normal human being how do you kill someone else? You know what I'm saying? Like that's all right. Like something's not right. Something's not right up there. You know what I mean? And I, I simply cannot fathom it. Cause I'm not a person who obviously is gonna kill someone. So it's like, I, I just can't imagine the things that would go through a mind of a person who is just so it has has so much hate in their heart for a group of people for what? because I'm a little darker than you. Like, I just, I never, I never understood it. You know, like, I'll be a thousand percent honest with you. I'm such a diplomatic person, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to play the devil's advocate and it's like, well, you know, there's, there's always gotta be a better way. But I, I'm not gonna sit and lie and say that I didn't feel the rage of the, the people in the videos where you see them looting and you see them breaking, you know, police car uh, windows and it's like we're we're angry you know oh I'm gonna get emotional but how can you not yeah you're on the edge you're you're, you're right there. you're on the cusp of something really dangerous happening and if we don't get a grip on it 
it's going to get out of control. Whereas right now, I just think that, you know, that could have possibly been me. I have daughters, I have uncles, I have, you know, I have brothers. That could easily have been me there doing whatever I'm doing, going through my normal day, just told my wife I'll be right back going to the store to get something to pick something up and not thinking about this could be my last time coming back home. And to have somebody to basically just suffocate you on camera is beyond fathom. You, you can't think of things like this. You can't write things like this because you don't think someone would take someone's life on camera with no remorse. No, he basically looking at the video, you can see the devil rearing his ugly head, not caring for the single life at hand. And when I watched the video, I was like, there's no way that he cannot see this guy on the ground is having a hard time breathing. He's telling you, if a guy screams for his mother, you know, help me, then you know that at this point it is very serious. Nobody, no grown man is gonna scream for their mother unless they're in some real pain. And when I heard that, I was like, and, and it almost got me, you know, I was a little bit upset that like, it's time to put the cameras down. Like you're recording this man and he's losing his life, but you're not doing anything. It's okay to record it. We need to have it filmed because we don't know a lot of things that's probably happening when things are not on the camera. But at some point we have to put the cameras down. And we have to intervene. I know it's, we have to have some type of money in place to, to get people out of jail or, you know, just we have to have things in place so people can understand like if something like this happens and you intervene, we got your back. Because I think that's what's happening. And we don't have anybody that has our back that we know if we get in the middle of this, something really goes down, we get arrested. Is there going to be someone to come save me? Is there going to be someone to come help me get out of jail? Is there a group of people that are going to come stand up for me? Putting hashtags out is one thing and we're, we're looting and you're destroying things. That's one thing. But jumping in the middle of that just for a split second just to change the whole narrative to just say hey get off this knee you're you're kneeing him on the on his neck and he cannot breathe he is losing his life right now instead of just saying oh hey i got you on video i have your badge number what are you doing and the police officer who is standing around they're just as guilty like we always say oh there's just one bad apple but if the bad apple is constantly happening over and over and again maybe the whole thing is bad you know they're they just have so much, they have so much hate for us. And to basically take a life on camera just breaks my heart. You know, a father, an uncle, a brother, you know, he had a girlfriend. Just breaks my heart to see this happening to our people and no one stepping up besides doing a hashtag. And then we just kind of, a couple of weeks go by and we're right back in the same situation. It kind of dies down to the next thing. We haven't even got over the Ahmaud Aubrey situation. It just happened in Georgia. So we go from that to this, all within a couple of weeks, you know? So this is just constantly happening. So we have to, I just think we just have to, you know, go a little deeper. We have to find our grassroots politicians to get in there and to, you know, when something like this happens, we have to enforce the law, charge them with those charges as if they were a regular person. Say, hey, when you strip all this down, they are a human being. That was murder that we saw on camera. That was basically murder. He just sat there on this guy's knee and he just basically took the life that right in front of us. So we need to have the charges the same and they're not being enforced. So I think we have to have those politicians from the grassroots up, get those guys in the office and don't have guys that are fold because that's what happened. And somebody will kind of pop up, we'll kind of get behind them and they get in the office and then something really happens and then they kind of fold under the pressure. We have to have somebody that, that won't fold under the pressure and we have to have these people at all local levels. The chief police, you gotta have um, the DAs, you gotta have judges, you gotta have mayors, you gotta have more people of color like us to understand what's going on out here. And we have to enforce the law because they're policing us, but nobody's policing them. And that's my biggest issue. Nobody's policing them. They're doing what they wanna do. They kill one of us. And then eventually they say, oh, we're gonna charge him. But then the charge either gets dropped, you're gonna put on administrative leave, and then it kind of goes under the rug. You don't hear anything about it until the next incident happens. So where do you think we go from here after we've seen something like this happen on camera? Where do we go from here? You know, I I, I thought about this earlier and it's, it's quite a layered response, you know, but um, I was thinking about 
how for so long, you know, black folks, but especially the black man, you know, had been stripped away from knowledge, freedom, you know, like everything that would qualify a person to continue this evolutionary process to become better, you know. And I sat back and I thought about it like, black people are so strong. They're so strong and resilient of a people. When I think of a black man, I think strength, I think warriors, you know what I mean? And it's 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 tragic that all you ever see, especially on on the media, is like if they're not a rapper or a ball player, like they're in jail or like they're they're painted as this like a lesser than in society. When in, in reality, if you think about you know, a black man who's been educated, who is physically fit, you know what I mean? Like, imagine the, the amount of power, you know what I mean? And with that intelligence and that power, you can, you can gather a group of people who might not have the answer, but you can, you can direct them, you know what I mean? And I think, I, I know this is kind of going on a tangent, but not really. This is why I think it was so tough for the black community to hear like even Nipsey Hussle dying because I think he was definitely one of those people who was a leader, who had such an influence over the black community and many others, you know, to gather to, to, um, to, want, to even have the desire to learn, you know what I mean? And, and he was making a big difference and I think the biggest threat to the people who are killing us is us learning, getting our power and exercising it. The last thing that they want is a bunch of educated black folks to retaliate. You know what I'm saying? I just, <laughs> I'm a little passionate because obviously I'm upset about the whole situation. Absolutely, and it's all about having the, the knowledge. And, and the necessary, one thing is having the knowledge, we have to apply the knowledge. You know, we have to have the people who have the knowledge and actually apply it and, and come up with um, solutions for us. You know, just marching and tearing things up. We've been through that. That, that doesn't get us anything done. We have to go, we have to take the next step. What do we do next? Like, where, where are we going from here? Like, we have to have a coalition of people come together and say, hey, we have to talk about the things that we that we want and we have to go to the people and get what we want. We either get what we want or we take what we want. You know, we're gonna get to that point where it's gonna be, you know, people are gonna start taking the law on their own hands because people are gonna start, you know, start getting more guns because they're gonna take their, they have the rights to go and pick up more handguns, more guns. And that's that's okay to protect yourself and defend yourself. But if you go out and you start killing police officers, what that's gonna do, we kill one of them, they're gonna kill 10 of us. We kill one more of them, they're gonna kill 20 of us because you're going against a, you're going against a force that has the, has, that has the ability to uh, mobilize. We're not together enough to do that. They're, we're dividing. We'll say, hey, we're, it's four or five people trying to come over here to do things where it's a hundred of them ready to go because they've been trained and they know what they want to do. They know how to accomplish it. But we just say, I'm going to get a gun. Something happens. I'm going to shoot and kill. But once you shoot and kill somebody, yeah, you get the knowledge. You say, oh, that happens, you know, rah, rah, rah. But then you have somebody in two states over. They just saw this in a police car. And the next stop they could be stopping could be somebody else's dad or mom. And they can shoot and kill. So I don't want people to just to grab the guns and just go out and be, you know, rah, rah, we got to go get them. We're going to take the lives. We're going to do this and do that. Don't do that. Yeah, you don't want to do that because that's just going to cause more problems. You know? I'm not saying don't defend yourself because we all have the right to defend ourselves. So if you have a handgun that's legal and it's registered, something happens, defend yourself at, at all costs because it's self-preservation first. But don't just go get the handgun and go chase somebody down you know, end of life, you take a life, now they're taking 10 more of ours. So that's why, like you said, come back to your, come back to your thought. We have to have the, have the knowledge, we have the people in place with the knowledge to lead. That's what our generation we're missing. We're missing those leaders. Like we're missing those Malcolms, we're missing those Marks. We have those people who, if something like this happened, we know that Malcolm's coming and he's gonna go, and he's gonna speak for the people. 
you know, right now we just have like like Sean King, you know, I, I follow a lot of his content because he's been kind of on the ground. He, him and his team, they've been kind of giving a lot of information, but that can't we can't put all the weight on one person. It has to be a team of people, you know, handling these situations all over the country that's speaking, that's speaking on our behalf, that we've nominated, that we've put put our faith in. We just can't have somebody just to pop up and just show up and he just do, does what he wants and say, oh, he's speaking on the behalf of us. No, you haven't got the authority just to do that. You, we have, you have to actually vote this person or nominate this person or kind of believe in this person. This person has to be nominated by somebody like a Killer Mike or Killer Mike, you know, Killer Mike. I love the way Killer Mike speaks. You know, I'm I'm happy he's, he hasn't gone into the politics side of like, let me run for office. Cause once, I feel like once you get into the office, your hands kind of get tired at times things like that, certain things happen you can't do anything because your hands are tied because of politics but when you're on the outside you can say what and you can do whatever you want because you're not tied or you're not bound to anything so you know when when those type of things continue to happen to us we until we mobilize and figure out what we want and we come together nothing's going to get accomplished we can't rely on the NAACP because they're not there for us to do anything they're not, all is going on, they're not stepping up. So we don't have like a LBGQT community or something like that. Like if something happened to some someone or a Jewish person, their community is gonna speak out loud. They're like, hey, this happened to us. We want, we want some, uh, we wanna get, we want to just we get justice. This has to happen now. But when something happens to us, we don't have that, we don't have that party to go and speak on our behalf, to demand our rights, to demand things. We're all separated. We're all fragmented. And when you're fragmented, nothing can get accomplished. And that's, you know, I can go off on a tangent about this because, like I said, I get passionate about it too. And like I said, I like to wait, you know, 24, 48 hours before I kind of get into the talk about it because you talk about it in your group chats and you can go back and forth. But until you actually put it out in the public, you know, you want to make sure you put it out on a, in a, on a good note and not necessarily put it out with anger. Like I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm upset. Yes, I am. That could have easily have been me on the ground with a boot to my neck or a knee to my neck, and my children could have not seen me anymore. You know, my, my kids are six and three. You know, imagine my kids growing up without me. You know, I'm in their, I'm in their lives every day, and then for someone to just take my life like that was just, you know, be horrendous. You know, we've talked about that. <laughs> I try to move on because we can go on and on about that. Uh, I noticed that you were going to the uh, the battle. I've been into the versus battle. Last we just saw Nelly and we, we saw Nelly and Luda. But the one I want to talk about is the Erica Badu and uh, Teal Scott. You know, if you're an elf, you know that age range. You you know what that music meant to you. What did that music mean? What did that battle mean? It wasn't even a battle. It was just like. Uh, uh, just for the soul, what did that mean for you at that time when you was listening for those two hours? How did you feel? First of all, way to way to shift the energy because he just brought me right all the way back up. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, oh my god. Okay, first and foremost, when I had seen Erica Badu and Jill Scott, first of all, legend. You have like what? I was so excited. I was promoting all of my Instagram. Like, hey y'all, check this out. You know, this is a do not miss event. Oh, um, I don't even remember how I even started listening to, uh, well, first and foremost, my dad is a, is a DJ. So I've heard all these different types of genres, and generations of music. Um, so I'm pretty sure he probably more than likely is the person who got me listening to Erica Badu. But I think I really discovered her and um, I want to say it was like my junior year of like sophomore year junior year of college and there was a song and it was like gone baby gone baby don't be long and i was just like i love this song you know and just her vibe is i feel like she is me and i am her because a lot of people know her as like a peaceful you know um just a, just her energy you know what i mean you can you can she, she radiates like the sun <laughs> But she will also turn it up on somebody real quick if need be. What she say? This tea and incense can turn into cold 45 and a pack of new ports if need be. You know, and I just, I rock with her so heavy because she's super real. She makes amazing music. Um, she's just, I, if I met her in this life, it would be a life worth living. And the crazy thing you say that I was on a plane back from, um, I was on a plane back from Dallas. And of course, she, I went on the flight a little bit later than I did, 
And as the flight deboarded, I was walking by and I was like, no. And you know how you take a moment and you think you're like, is that? And she like looked at me. Oh my goodness. Like, hey, you know, and I was like, that's just, yeah. And then I kind of got off the plane and we, I, was at, I was at the board trying to see, you know, trying to see where the gate was, trying to get out and all that good stuff. And she was walking out with her, with her, with another person, with her friend or somebody, one of her coworkers or whatever. And I was like, hey, I was like, hey, hey. She was like, hey, how you doing? You know, and I was like, that just that, just that, that energy that she had, it was just so, you know, it was just so powerful. Just being in her presence in that moment, it was just like, this is greatness right here. And being this close to greatness was amazing. You know, just listening to that, listen to that versus battle. It was just so feeling for the soul. You know, you just sat there for two hours and it was no competition. You're just playing records. She played, Erica Badu played this record and Gia plays this record. And then just the energy and drinking wine is just like so much positivity in the air and just listening to them talk. And I didn't even realize that uh, Jill Scott, her first song that she ever wrote, she, um, Erica Badu actually sang the song. I was like, whoa, you just getting this, you getting this behind the scenes of some of the greatest music that would come up in our time. And you're just hearing it right now and you're seeing how it came about and you just listen to their stories of how they made the music, what they were going through at the time. And those type of things like that were just, you know, so fulfilling for me. You know, sometimes I, you know, I listen to more R&B back in the day because I have older sisters. So, you know, I listen to rap, but then when my sisters come around, it's more R&B. You listen to Jagged Edge, you listen to Whitney Houston, you listen to Mariah Carey, you listen to all this R&B. So I got opportunities to hear this music, not knowing that later on, that this is going to be the vibe. So because at the time I'm listening, I'm listening to Snoop, I'm listening to Dre, I'm listening to all, I'm listening to Chronic, I'm listening to all this other, you know, just hard pop, you know, I'm listening to all this hardcore music. And then my sister come in and play some Whitney Houston. I'm like, why are you playing this? But you can't deny how great the music is. You know, you listen to the music and it just seeps into your subconscious and your soul. And then as you get older, you listen back to that music, like it pushes you back. Like, oh man, I remember when I heard this song, what I was doing and what I was feeling. You know, I don't quite get that with a lot of the music now, but back then when you hear a song over and over and over, you know what was going on in your life. And that's how I kind of gauge like what I was doing by hearing a certain song when it comes on. like, oh, I remember when I was at this age, I was doing this when the song came. So when you were hearing that, when you were hearing that music, what kind of mind state was it putting you in? Oh my goodness, see, music, different, different genres and you know, they all resonate on different levels. Now, when it comes to Jill Scott and Erica Badu, it resonates, like you said, on a soulful level. You can't even really, like, ugh. okay, I was on my phone and I'm watching them going back and forth, just the interaction. I'm, I, I don't get starstruck over too many people, <laughs> but these are definitely two people to be starstruck over. Um, I was just sitting there <clears throat> watching them, you know, converse, and then they'd ease on to, into the song, and it's like every single song, back to back, it was like, oh, that's a slapper. Like, <laughs> it's a classic, timeless classic. You can't help but sing along, you know, and it's like, I've never been to an Erica Badu concert, probably yet, yet, <laughs> or a Jill Scott concert, but it felt like one, you know, it's like, they're sitting right there, they're conversing. And then especially because you were able to kind of interact with them in the sense of writing chats, you know, hoping that they would see, you know, what you just wrote. Oh my gosh. Just, I was on cloud nine. Like, I was just so happy. I was in a vibe, I was singing, you know, I'm singing with them and I'm not caring who else outside my window or my door can hear me. Cause it was just such a good vibe. Like the whole, I watched the whole thing through. Me too. I, I, think you know, just, I think they should put a versus tour together. I think they should, after all this is over, kind of figure out their schedule and have a versus tour with all these people who are battling. You have Nelly and Luda, and you have, uh, what was that? A couple of other the battles that happened. I can't think off the top of my head, but a couple of other battles that were happening. And then you had the Jill Scott, and then you have Beanie Man, you have all these people who were doing these battles and kind of figure out their schedule and kind of like just tour and give us that old music that we were reminiscing on. Just, you know, some of that, some of that Memphis music that we were reminiscing on, some of that great music that we we remember, and that they brought a tour together. And I think that would really be big for the culture to kind of just bring all that music back together and put it under one roof. Because right now it's like 
you had Jill Scott down, they probably were touring. They weren't doing a lot of different cities because you're, you listen to all the rap. So those are the people who come into the city. So that's what you hear. When you hear that, that nice vibe, you don't quite get it all the time. So, you know, if you had to put an ultimate playlist together, what kind, of, what kind of music would be on your playlist? Oh my goodness, okay. First of all, I think Maxwell deserves a spot on there, definitely. Uh, one, two. I'm pretty sure I have like a old, I don't even want to call it old school, it's just classics, you know, it's just yeah. like a classic. But truth be told, um, because my dad was a DJ, I was exposed to so many different types of music. So I can stick to, you know, um, oldies, you know, the Luther Vandross and the and, oh, Anita Baker. I love me some Anita Baker. Um, I could I could just keep going on and on, but I also have like you got Jimi Hendrix, you yeah. know, and uh, Lenny Kravitz. Like it's just so when the home all over the place. Homie comes and pick you up. What has to be playing in the What has to be playing in the car when you get in? What kind of music do you want to hear when you get in the car when you guys are come to scoop you up? You guys want to go ride out and go hit the town for the night? What kind of <laughs> when you get in the car at that moment? When you get in the car, you want to hear what? you know wow um i don't know if he should have like something specific but i think it it also is like what kind of date are we going on the first the first name that popped in my mind was usher i don't know like i, I just like okay you know it's kind of fun it's still like i feel like usher is he's fun and romantic but then you get the you know what i'm saying <laughs> the other side of him you know we know usher but then to the new age people probably like Put some Chris Brown on. It's almost equivalent, I think, to put some Chris Brown. You know, you know what I'm saying? But you got Usher, who was doing, who was Chris Brown in his day. You know, but when they get, I just don't know nothing about good music. <laughs> want to hear that trap music? Do you want to R and B? You want to hear that, that, that lo-fi type music? What kind of tone are we in? What kind of tone? Are we in? I love some lo-fi for sure. Lo-fi though, I think that's like background music for literally like if you're cleaning if you're reading you're preparing something like lo-fi is just really good even if you're having like a really good conversation you know like right now i would probably have some lo-fi going on in the background it's yeah. not invasive there's not like too many lyrics it's just a smooth you know uh just, just beat just you know melodies and stuff but i'm <sighs> I, as far as trap music, I'm not gonna go so far as to be like, no, nah, I don't like trap music. It's a lot that I don't like, but let a certain trap song come on and I'm in that mood, you know, I'm gonna turn up. Like, there, there's just a time and place for certain kinds of music. So, I mean, if I hop in the car and I'm like dressed like, you know, I'm dressed up, I'm a lady tonight, you know what I mean? And you over here blasting trap music, I'm like, <laughs> this date might be a little short, <laughs> you know? So. I throw some on I wanna hear. So who's some of your favorite art? Who's some of your favorite artists? Okay, so I just thought about this the other day, and right now, okay, so I'm I'm trying to incorporate new artists because I'm I the radio is trash to me. I'm sorry. But, uh, so I build my own playlist, and I usually just like switch between like how I'm feeling that day. But as of recently, outside of Erica Badu, and my my top be like okay obviously Erica Badu I have Miguel Janae Aiko I've stepped out and I've I've been learning about new artists my ultimate favorite right now is Masego mm -hmm. uh, Masego and Anderson Pack those are definitely the two um I think I pronounced it like Kate Chinata. I don't know but yeah but there's there's certain songs that I've been introduced it's a, it's a certain kind of sound it's a what is it? What do they call it? Um, trap house jazz funk. <laughs> oh, that's a lot. It, yeah, it is. But when you listen to it, like if you um, if you listen to Masego and you listen to Anderson Pack, you can kind of hear that sound. But I really like Masego because first and foremost, like, I love jazz music, and he kind of flipped it and added like this modern twist to it. You know, it's it's not necessarily hip hop, but he modernized jazz music and he kind of gave it a little up-tempo, you know, feel to it. And that man is talented. Like he could play any instrument. He's like the new age prince, you know what I mean? So I really rocks with Masego. Yeah. And I 
And what you say, those playlists, I've been kind of like doing my playlists on Spotify and I share them on my Instagram stories. So I have like, you know, I have my, my rap song, then I have my, my mood, my mood music, you know, and I like to, cause I lately I've been in my party next door vibe like a lot lately, you know, you drop an album. So I listen to a lot of that. And then I've been like discovering new music like, like today, just like this, you know, look, you know, just finding new people and listening to new R&B and, and letting some of that seep into your subconscious instead of just, you know, cause I've been not really listening to a lot of rappers more than like more R&B, 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 just getting the, getting the vibes right. Cause when, I, when I'm working on photos, I don't like to listen to a lot of rap. I like to listen to like, you know, like lo-fi music or something with a little bit more melodic. So that part next door, he's like really kind of like been on the top of my brain lately. You know, like I said, Miguel, Kaleidoscope Dreams, that's like a sick album. Adorn has to be one of the best songs in our in our history. I don't think, I don't know if he can make anything better than Adorn. You know, I don't know if he can even do that. I don't know. I don't know. But that Adorn was like, the one so i understand i feel you when it comes to that um to miguel so when you i know we've been talking about like you know going about your, your modeling and fashion and trap bar and you know we come through that so what, what inspires you we kind of keep this let me be a model thing off oh my goodness okay 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 i'm gonna try to give you the condensed version but long story short 2018 was a trash year for me probably one of the worst I had ever experienced before and it just put me into this like really like spiritually drained you know um, state of being and so towards the end of 2018 early like January 2019 I kind of dedicated myself to just like tuning out the rest of the world and becoming a major introvert but doing so to um, to focus on my personal development and uh, one of those things was like towards what was that September I want to say towards September I had conquered pretty much everything else I had set out for myself now the challenge was to become an extrovert again a social butterfly you know and I think um, even my dad was kind of like you know you should uh, you should try to put yourself out there again you know because I really was a social person it was just having experienced a lot you know it's like it just made me want to retreat back away from the world um, so Ironically enough, I think within that same week that I had that conversation with my dad, and he's just, you know, pumping me up, like, you just go try, like, do something, you know, do something new. I coincidentally ended up receiving an email, like, one of the newsletters from Trap Art saying, like, hey, we have a model casting. And I was like, okay. I, I would be real. I've never wanted to be a model. Really? If, if, if I was to be known for anything, I wanted to be for my character, my intelligence, what I make, you know, like the products that I produce or, you know, how I contribute to the world outside of how I look. You know what I mean? I, I never wanted to just be like, oh, there's the other, you know, girl who gets off on her looks. You know what I mean? Like that, that's not my goal at all. But, you know, modeling has turned out to be a very fun experience. Um, I'm not in it to be the next Naomi Campbell. And I think that's honestly what what takes the pressure away from it because I get to have fun you know the designers are awesome you know um, a lot of the times the outfits are <laughs> they're pretty they're, they're probably not even something that I would wear on a daily basis so it's really fun to, to dress up and and be you know in front of the cameras and, and, and rock it you know what I mean like step into that into that light and so I went to the model casting and you know a couple designers had, had chosen me for uh for each of their sets so my very first modeling experience was being in every set of that first fashion show like every you know every set I was in so it was just it was really exciting yeah it's, it's <laughs> because I don't see that because I do I do a lot of the photography for the fashion shows so I don't get the chance the opportunity to see the sets before they happen so I like to experience it. I'm not, like most photographers, they probably want to be there throughout the night or you know when they're doing the practices and things like that. I'm different. I don't want to be there. I want to experience it just like everybody else is experiencing. I know that's probably weird because I want to experience it when they're experiencing it so I can have that same joy and that feel when I'm shooting it. So it, it comes through my lens. So I want to like tell a story when I'm taking a picture. So when I take a picture of somebody, I want to be a genuine picture, not just me snapping a photo and then just kind of working on it. I want it to be a picture. So when someone, when that person sees that picture, if I, when I post it, they'd be like, hey, he really put his all into this photo. He really captured me how I want to be seen in the future. Cause think about, it. I think about when I take a picture, 
I want this picture to be something that this person can look back on 20 years from now and be like, show their kids like, hey, when I was at this age, I did this. Look how I looked at this point. I don't want to necessarily take a picture of someone who's taking a bad angle and things like that. So I really try to put my all when I'm shooting. So, you know, shoot, I've, I've actually shot you more times than I probably thought about. Now I think about it, I go back, I'm like, she's been in a lot of different sets, but because you guys are wearing so many different you know, different outfits and your makeup change and your hair change and the things are happening so fast and it's dark. I don't necessarily, and people don't realize that when I'm shooting a fashion show, I don't actually enjoy the fashion show in that moment, really. I don't really enjoy it until I start going back and editing the pictures. And I was like, oh, this was happening. That because it's happening so fast, you guys are coming so fast. And I'm like, hey, they need to slow down. But nobody's slowing down because they're probably nervous. It's probably their first time doing it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like let me just get down here stop get my cue turn around and get back I'm like no just slow down take a few seconds you know just you know slow it down and then over time and I can tell like the models who probably went from the first time doing it to the third time doing it that they can kind of all right I got the nerves out you know I can kind of take my time I don't have to rush and things like that so that's what that's how I really that's why I really enjoy the fashion part of it you know because that gives me an opportunity to capture a lot of different things at a, at a given time and it gives me an opportunity to tell a, a longer story throughout the night because when people see the photos, they was like, oh, I remember what, when, when she wore this. Well, I didn't get a chance to see this because the light was doing this or the light or somebody was blocking me. But they see the photos like, oh, wow, that outfit looks amazing with this designer because if you're working with crazy designers, they're doing amazing work. It's crazy the work that they can do in a short amount of time that they're giving. And the, the choreography that you guys go through, it's, it's amazing. So I give my hat, I just put my hat to you guys for you know being able to accomplish that in such a, a short amount of time. So when you're when you're modeling, when you come down the runway, what is going through your mind? Like I'd be wanting to know what's going through this model mind. Do they, are they looking for the camera or are you trying to look beyond the camera or are you counting in your head five steps, make sure I turn here or my points? What is, what's going through your mind when you're walking down the runway? You know. I really can't speak on behalf of any other models or you know, people walking down one way. I know me personally, I try to take that like just before I make my, you know, my debut onto the stage or whatever. It's, it's really like a sense of um, grounding, you know. Um, I normally like do the whole, uh, you know, and, and mentally I'm stepping into Know, uh, this 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 version of myself who I perceive to be like you know who do you see yourself in the future you know when, when they used to ask you like what do you want to be when you grow up you know and you imagine the most successful version of yourself you know oh they drive this they act like this they read this they dress like that you know what I mean like you think so highly of this future self right and so in those in those moments just before I walk out in order to gain that sense of composure and confidence and you know the charisma that you need and, and you know reminding yourself like hey smile you know don't let them see how nervous you are you know like it's all in the eyes the face the walk the arms you know everything like that what helps me to really be in that present moment is taking that deep breath beforehand and closing my eyes you know and by the time i open my eyes i am that person like I am the future me. I'm stepping into that moment, and that's where the confidence comes from because it's it really is just a shift in mentality, you know. And and all the time that I took throughout 2019, learning, reading these books, how to rewire my own brain, you know, and fixing, changing narratives and how I conduct myself throughout the world, you know what I mean, or just in society. That's something that I've I've uh, I've learned to perform. You know, when I need to show a sense of bravery or, you know, to really be present with confidence and, like, assertiveness, you know, like, this is you. Be confident, you know? So that's that's what goes through my mind. And I, and I, I love that because I saw how Trap Art has evolved from just coming from a small a small venue to a medium-sized venue to a large venue to going from just the parties and the art to actually putting on the show is that it's now is actually a show it's a show we're, we're, we're entertaining you with something that's visually appealing and it gives uh, gives an opportunity to local artists who haven't had that that opportunity to get out in front of the people because it's a, it's okay to just post on the gram but then you have to actually be able to you know 
know, get it out to the people and let people see what you're doing. Come out of that, that back room or that basement when you're you're making these, you're, you're hand stitching these clothes. When you actually put it on a model and you just see it coming out of the runway and just see it come to fruition with the ideas that you have. And it's just like, it, it gives you a sense of gratitude. It gives a grat uh, uh, instant, instant gratification because you see it right then. And you see the reaction that people give you because sometimes when you, you post something or you, you somebody buys a shirt from you and somebody sees that person in, you don't actually get their reaction. But when you put it on a model and they come down a runway, you get the instant gratification at that moment. And it's just such a great feeling to have the, the art, the fashion show, the culture, the people and the vibe all in one. And with being able to capture that, and it's, 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 helped, it's helped me grow as an artist as well too, because you know it's forcing me to get out of my comfort zone to shoot things that I wouldn't naturally shoot. Like I wouldn't naturally just shoot a, a fashion show because it's happening so fast, and you're worried like I could mess this up. But in the in the, in the moment, you're like, let me do the best that I can, and I live with the results. And so that's why I try to do my best anytime I snap a photo of someone. I don't want someone to be like, man, he just don't care. He just did this. His work is terrible. So I put, I try to master my craft and get better at each fashion show because I remember the first fashion show I shot. I was like, wow, what am I? How am I going to shoot this? You don't know what you, what's going to have you like? Because I, I never seen the same. Like, how am I going to shoot this? And then all of a sudden, you start getting your rhythm. You start getting the confidence. And things starting to get better. And I can just see like. And the models, they're getting, they're getting better. And I'm getting better. The fashion shows get better. It's just growing. So with you being a part of Trap Art, I know you went from the fashion show to more or less working behind the scenes now. So tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, man. That's been a blessing, a straight blessing. Uh, coincidentally, it was that same, it was within the same week I had received the uh, newsletter email that they were looking for models. Uh, they had also sent out another one saying they were looking for marketing interns. I was like, oh my gosh, I, that was another thing that I really wanted to do. I was bartending at the time, and while it was fun, you know, and it would help me to pay my bills, it was not, it's just like, I don't want to be a bartender for the rest of my life. I definitely don't want to be working for the rest of my life. So um, my goal essentially was to find an internship or a position where I can fuse my passion for art, you know, just the, everything that's in the art world, and pair that with business and marketing and somehow like I graduated with a degree in international business marketing but I have a passion for graphic design and photography that's what I initially went to school for mm -hmm. so after having graduated with a business degree I still have that passion you know that lingering passion for art and finding trap art was such a blessing because that's exactly what I ended up falling into you know um, I started doing the marketing internship there was at least 10 other people you know, trying to get that same position. And uh, I just remember you know, CEOs saying, out of all the interns of the previous round, there was only one girl, one girl <laughs> who got hired, you know, like paid position and everything. And so I'm thinking as I'm sitting next to the other nine, 10 people, like, no, that's gonna be me. <laughs> you know, like, it's, I'm, I want this, you know, I want this. And I have such a drive and a passion and a respect for them because they built this from the ground up. Shout out to Amina and Jesse. Yeah. They are, you know, my role models, my idols. I really do look up to them, not just because, you know, what they're doing, but who they are as people. They're, they're super awesome. And I'm just super blessed to be working with them. Absolutely. Like, I remember when I first moved here, because like I said, I actually graduated with a graphic design degree. So I, I got my I got my undergrad in graphic design and I got my master's in IT. And so when I moved out here from the Bay, and I moved from the Bay, I moved from Atlanta. So we moved out here, you know, I started fresh. I didn't have a job. I had to come out here, I found a job. I got to kind of start getting on my feet. And I was kind of getting out in the scene and kind of just talking to people. And I was like, man, hey, what's, what's, what's the do out here? And they was like, you ever heard of Trap Bar? I was like, nah, what's that? It was like, and so I went to a couple of them. I was like, I saw the art and I saw the vibe and I saw the, the culture. I was like, oh yeah, that's where I need to be. It is, it is it inspired me. And I was so inspired by it. I was like, oh, I gotta catch, catch another one. So I went about two or three and then I told my homie, I was like, look, I'm not coming back to another one of these that I have to pay for. I gotta get on the other side, you know? I, Cause I, before, when I was in Atlanta, I used to run around and do photography at a lot of the venues in, in Atlanta. And so I was like, man, I could do that here, you know? And so I hit them up, you know, just talked to them. I was like, oh, yeah, man, come through. And then, you know, that that one night just 
springboarded me to where I am now with them. You know, you know, we've been actually been able to expand the business, been going to different cities, you know, putting on different events in Houston, Dallas, and going to different places in Austin. And so giving me that opportunity, you know, talking to talking to, like I said, talking to Jesse, and we were just kind of vibing on a different level. We were reading the same different watching reading the same books. We was like watching some of the same things. So we was like really in tune with one another. So that's how our relationship built. We, we were both both married. We had at the time we didn't have kids, so I had my first one, and then he was like, "Oh, I'm about to have mine." So it was like, <laughs> you know, the, the thing that we we had a lot of things in common, and so you know, giving them, giving me the opportunity, like I said, shout out to them. You know, we continue to grow, and I want to see where we're definitely going to go from here. It's going to be you know, amazing. It's gonna, once the pandemic and everything lift, and we kind of get back to things as normal, we can kind of grow a little bit more. And it's it's going to be it's going to be amazing how much further we're going to go now that everybody's going to be really ready to party. They're going to be there setting up when the DJ gets there. There's no more going to be, let me show up at 1230. I, I just get there when I get there. It's going to be like, no, when the doors open at 10, 11, they're going to be there at 10 with the 930. Like, hey, look, we're ready to get in. Can we get in now? And it's like, no, nah, hold up. But, you know, I'm excited to see that. And I'm happy for you that you had the opportunity to kind of see some of the behind the scenes things and, and enjoy that opportunity and see where you're going to go from here because I, I have no, I have no, 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 I have no reservation that you're going to grow and who knows your modeling career could take off. It only takes one, it only takes one photo. People don't realize that it only takes one photo. You could be working for two or three years. It just takes one photo from one person, from one person to see it and then your whole life could change. So when you say you don't want to be the next Naomi Kami, I wouldn't say that. I would just say, hey, I would love to, you know, continue my career. If something like that happens, I will be open for it because you never know what God has planned for you. You know, you could be shutting down your blessings by saying, "Oh, I don't." Want <laughs> you could be bigger than her. Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh. It only takes it only takes one photo to change your life. It only takes one one person to kind of put you in that right position. You know, and next thing you know, you could be off to the races and things like that. So. I would say don't put any limitations on what you think you can do with your career because you can do because people don't realize something as small as the, the trap bar here is in the bay it may be huge to someone else because they can't get to it they just see it online and it's like man i gotta get to this i gotta get to this and if you get the, if the right person coming to the room and see you at that right moment on that stage it's over you could be out of here you could be out of here so don't limit don't limit yourself I know you trying to slide me a bag to model. I'm not gonna turn it down. <laughs> yeah, I know you were saying like you, you um before you before the pandemic you were doing some bartending. So give me your favorite couple of drinks that you would like you would love to make. I'm a Moscow Mule kind of guy. I like Moscow Mule. That's because I'm not a big drinker. So, but I do like to you know when I have to go out with the homies, I socialize. I might get a drink, maybe drink a half of. I'm not a big drinker. But if you had to make a drink. What's your special drink that you, you like to make? You know, it's funny you say Moscow Mules because that's definitely one of my like top four go-tos. Um, margaritas, boom, easy, you know, it tastes great, get the job done, you know. Um, my personal favorite, it, it's really dependent on the occasion. You know, if I'm on a date, more than likely I'm drinking a red wine. Okay. Um, if I'm socializing, it's ladies' night, you know, not ladies' night, but like girls' night out, I'm drinking a lemon drop because it's cute, it's classy, and it still gets the job done. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then if it's just like, you know, I go to a bar, like I'd love to go to um, San Jose bars in Santana Row and like just kick it listening to you know, music or, you know, hanging out with friends, I, I would more than likely be having a Moscow meal in my hand or like an angry orchard because I don't drink beer beer <laughs> but I'll do like a, a nice cider beer or something. Are you are your two drinks and you're done or is a two three possible four or just we, I'm just drinking one glass and I, I know my limitations here? Uh well it depends on <laughs> again the um, the vibe you know you got the vibe you know yeah because Came through, he scooped you up, he got the right music playing. Y'all allowed it to venue now, y'all chilling, y'all relaxing. He, you say, bring me the red wine, or what you drinking? When you say, when you go to order, what do we, what you drinking? Get that, get that nice night going. What, we, what you drinking? I normally do Cabernet. Cabernet 
Cabernets are just, mm, they're bold, they're delicious. Or I'll do like a red blend, um, like a pop of red is really good. Um, yeah, but I, I normally stick to Cabernets. Plus they're good for your heart, <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's probably my go-to. As far as the number of drinks though, two. It depends on my intention for the end of the night. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Okay, that's one. Uh, one, or we getting we getting one to just kind of ease the tension, or we getting two, maybe two and a half, where we know, hey, look, this this is going down at the end of the night. We got to be. No, 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 no. I'm definitely no. It's I'm not gonna like. I'm not gonna get too deep in on that end. But what I'm going to say is, you know, if um if I'm feeling a little tense. I don't know you and it's just like the jitters of like first dates and stuff like that I think um standard is definitely like two drinks because the first is like okay that's our first round of drinks and then it's like hey let's go in for another one like everything's going good okay you can kind of gauge by the end of the first drink whether you even want to be there or not um but normally like yeah you go for the second drink just to because at the end of the second drink I think you feel comfortable enough to like have real conversation to really feel like you're vibing with that person and stuff. Uh, three drinks at that point, it's like okay, y'all really having a good time. So it's, it's, at that point, it's, as long as you guys are getting back home safe or you know getting wherever, um, you're Ubering, cool, you know. But I think at that point, I'll probably do like two drinks and like a celebratory shot, you know, to end up end it all off. Okay. But three drinks, that's like okay, <laughs> what you really trying to do? <laughs> Are you are you into are you are you into like bar hopping or are you just more or less kind of go to one venue and just chill and just stay there and throughout the night or you like to kind of go here see what the vibe like drink a drink here then we are gonna go hop over here and go hit another bar are you into that type of stuff or are you like bar hopping? Bar hopping, it's just it's yes I love to bar hop. Um, if I'm not home or at work, I go to the bar. <laughs> I'm not a clubby type of person anymore. Um, the bar is just real cool, you know like. I actually live in an area where there's three bars within each within like walking distance. So it's it's normal for the customers to like start at this bar and then when they start to close down, you know, you go to this bar, but each one of them has a real distinct flavor to it. You know, like you start over here, but then you go to the ratchet bar and then you end up at this bar and you know I've I just I mean, I have so many stories as far as bar hopping, but yeah, that's definitely like a a thing, you know. Definitely thing. Since, since you're a bartender, are you judging people drinks when they bring them to you? Are you judging drinks? Am I judging drinks? Um, I'm I'm so much more aware when I go to any food, you know, establishments. Um, now I'm so much more patient because I understand what it takes to be a bartender. And I think for people who have never worked in the food service industry, you know, they're they're just oblivious and you know, the way that they talk to their servers or their bartenders sometimes people can get out of pocket um but as far as like bartending i just i love it <laughs> i love bartending it's just it's, it's super fun um, what are some of the turn what are some of the turnoffs that you have like somebody kind of picking you up y'all out on a date what are some of those things that kind of like say hey this is uh, i think i'm ready to go i think i'm ready to turn it in but like I'm gonna call my Uber. What's what's that what's that turn off that's gonna say make you go call an Uber to take, come take you home? Off a date or if I'm working as a bartender? And on a date, like what's what's that moment when you're like, I know I think it's time for me to call my Uber. I'm not feeling this. You know, thankfully I don't think I've ever had an experience where like I needed to get away from this person like ASAP. Uh, but I usually like Oh, it's getting late. I'm kind of tired, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I mean, I think I start to give off like um, body, like my body language kind of gives it off. You know, my my vibe is not as inviting. Like I think at that point, you know, you can kind of tell. Um, I'm also pretty respectful as far as like letting them know, like. So uh, so yeah, what what you got going on tomorrow? <laughs> you know, yeah, I think they get the. Now, I have been seeing, I've seen that um, online, I saw a young lady who was talking about dating guys with kids and things like that. And she said she didn't prefer to date guys with kids for her reasons, I don't know. She just said, hey, I don't prefer to date guys with kids. And in that post, they came at her neck. So how do you feel? Oh, how do you feel about, you know, dating guys with kids? Would you date someone with kids and things like that? Or how do you feel about that? 
we live in a cancel culture society and that's why I think a lot of people came for her. The fact of the matter is it really does have to boil down to preference. You know, I think she's not wrong for saying, you know, I, I have a preference. However, I do think that when you, first of all, let me get out of the way. I've talked to people who have children, like that's not a problem. Um, I do think though, it, it's just certain things that come with being with someone who has children. You know, people have to understand like there's certain responsibilities that you take on or like you have to be a little bit more patient with that person you can't see them because they're taking care of their kids you know um i'm a daughter of a single father and you know he's had his relationships and everything so i kind of i see it on both ends you know i i had you know my dad's girlfriends trying to kiss up to me and you know be all extra nice which is fine with me you know they buy me gifts and whatnot but as a as an adult now um having to consider you know maybe my soulmate already has children type of thing like I mean it, it again it comes down to preference do you prefer to you know usurp these certain responsibilities that come with dating a person who has children or you know you just simply prefer not to deal with that because some people just they they're not cut out for it you know what I mean so you can't really you can't blame them you know but um I also do think that by saying I'm not gonna date anybody you know has kids already it's like that person could have gone through something like maybe maybe the mom you know his, his baby mama or something maybe she was wrong like maybe she cheated on him and it was out of his control you know what I mean and that's why they're no longer together because you can't fault him for having you know for for having tried with someone and it didn't work out like that person can be amazing you know what I mean and it was him who got screwed over so don't you know don't rule him out Absolutely. And when you said you were raised by a single father, what were some of those traits that your dad had that you want to see in your partner in life? What, what are some of the things you want to see that your partner has that your dad has? Um, man, <laughs> a lot of things. My dad is my hero. My dad is Superman. He's invincible, you know, to me. Uh, he was an amazing father. My father actually didn't have a father in his life. Really? So, the fact that he turned out to be this amazing, amazing parent, you know, I mean, I would hope that my partner didn't <laughs> even halfway match up to who my father is. Yeah. And I've taken a class in, in back in college and I don't know, I think it was sociology. And it's just this one thing that stood out for me from that class that most women marry guys who are similar to their brothers and most guys marry women who resemble their mother you know have the traits of their mother so it's kind of weird like that and that's why i kind of actually i was like what kind of traits that because you know everybody has their different things that they're looking for in a guy and we're all kind of find, trying to find our mate for life which is a hard thing in the dating pool so with you in this dating pool how is the dating scene in this area how is it you know i haven't been in the area i've been married 10 years for more like 15 years now so I don't know anything about that. So how is it out there? Is it tough? I have single friends and they kind of tell me what's going on. So I kind of live through them. But how how, did, how is it for you out there? Okay. Um, I'll paint a picture. You know, they say there's a million fish in the sea. You know, keep, keep fishing or, you know, you're whatever, whatever, whatever. Me, personally, I done took my rod out the pond. I'm cool. <laughs> I don't, at the moment, I am single by choice. Um, it's just, I would rather take this time, you know, this, this use that I have to focus on the development of my future. Um, again, being a daughter of a single father, he definitely instilled a certain level of independence, you know, this to, to be able to do something as a woman without needing a man you know what i'm saying like be a very independent person and so i think that is what helps to propel my independence now you know uh, free from men don't get me wrong like i love love i love to be in relationships you know but because i value love and marriage and children and that whole you know american dream or whatever i i hold that so close to my heart and it's so sacred to me and i realize that right now People within my age range, 
they're either already in a relationship with the person that they're gonna be with, you know, or are they trifling. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know. Like, I think it's just right now I'm I'm more focused on building my empire. So when he comes along, you know, he has his, I have mine together, we have ours. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to latch on to a dude and, you know, oh she only want me for my money like oh, no, i don't yeah. i got my you know <laughs> so when he comes along like i'll i can wait i don't i don't mind because i actually i love me i love being single i can go take myself out you know when <laughs> before quarantine hit you know i would take myself out on a date i didn't need somebody i would buy my own flowers you know because well if i won't who will <laughs> Would you would you move away from the bay if you had to? If you just like, hey, I just want to get a fresh start in a new city. Would you move away from the bay? And if so, what city would you move to? I definitely feel like uh, the Bay Area is like my my jump off point. I'm originally from Southern California, um, but ever since I was seven years old, and I would like bounce between my my grandmother, my maternal grandmother's house my dad's and my mom's house it's like I was always moving you know so regardless of whether or not I wanted to move it was a thing you know so I had to get used to saying goodbye to people I'd probably never see again you know but also I think my dad helped to make me think like you know what think of it as growing your network you have friends in Texas California Nevada Arizona so now as I'm like facing well now I'm in my adulthood I'm thinking once I conquer the Bay Area and you know achieve all that there is to achieve out here, I'm looking at New York. New York, okay. I've only, I've been in New York once, and you know it was it was just like a quick in and out, so I haven't really had, had the experience of New York. And me personally, I've moved around, so I've lived in like Jacksonville, I live in Nashville, I live in Atlanta, so I've lived in different places. So I see how cultures are different across the country. And now living here in the Bay Area, just you know, I've always you know, I come from a really small town. You know, our town is like less than 10,000 people. So, you know, my town was a town that everybody came to to do all the shopping and all that good stuff. So, you know, you knew your neighbors, you knew the people across town. You start dating this girl, you ask, their parents ask who your parents are, who you some kin to. So everybody knows everybody. But then when I moved out, you know, I graduated from school and I went to different cities and you kind of just start venturing out and meeting different people from different cultures. Because where I come from, it's more or less, you see the, you basically, all the blacks don't live on one side of town, all the whites live on the other side of town. So when you go to college, you start mingling with other people, but then when you live in the city, you're mingling like it's a melting pot. You, you, you hit people, like Kurdish people, Indian, Asian, you just, you, you're around more cultures. And so you see things differently because you're now being exposed to more things. And so that's why I've always, when I was a kid, I always like, hey, when, I, when I'm old enough, I'm moving away, I'm moving to different places, so I want to see different things. And so I've had the opportunity to live on both coasts. So I, I know how it, how the West Coast works and how the East Coast works and how the South feels, but I'm not going up north. That. That's not, it's too cold up there. There's, there's too much snow, it's too cold for me. I'm a, I'm a country boy, I can't handle the snow. If it go six inches, I'm shut down. They like, no, this is just a normal day, I can't do it. So if you had to choose LA or New York, which one would you choose? I would choose, man, I don't know. I would choose them for different reasons. If we're talking about weather, come on, LA all day. LA got the best weather. I I personally, I love the heat. I know a lot of people be like, oh my God, it's 80 degrees, 90 degrees, it's so hot. I'm like, listen, SoCal will get to like 115 easy, you know, but I'm used to it. So I love the heat. I'm a sunflower. I go sunbathing. That's the one thing that I'm super reluctant like when it comes to New York because blizzards, the cold, that is out. <laughs> That's not me. But I know it also, I've, I've heard, I've never actually been to New York in the summertime. I've only ever gone in the winter. Um, but I hear that, you know, New York gets just as hot in the summertime, so. Yeah, that's the thing about New York and, and down in South Bay, the humidity. So it'll be 96 with 110 degrees heat index. And so it'll be like, it's just muggy. So you go out and take a shower, you go outside, you feel all sticky. So I hear when it gets hot, it's just kind of, it's just hot. It's not like sticky hot. But when you're in the South, it's sticky hot, you know, mosquitoes, all the different stuff you have to deal with. And you're like, man. And then when I go home, because I've been living out here for so long, or if I, I haven't lived in my hometown since I was like 17, 18. So when I go home to visit and it's around the summertime and the mosquitoes out and you're out with your homies and like, and you're like not used to the mosquitoes, like, man, I've been gone 15 years, man. 
to this anymore. This is not, it's not what I'm used to. And they think you act funny, but it's not, you know, you're not. You're just like, hey, I don't have to deal with mosquitoes. And then when I come back and I'm just saying the mosquitoes, like, man, let's go to the house. They're like, man, you're not built for this. I'm like, no, man, I haven't done it. Before. I'm not built for this anymore. Now, since you've been at home with the pandemic, have you found yourself shopping more? And if so, what kind of what kind of things have you been buying more since you've been at home that you probably wouldn't have been buying when you things were probably on the up and up? I'm gonna be real. I when I first started getting, you know, the, the large lump sums, you know, due to unemployment and stimulus and stuff, I was not. I think because I was just like seeing, you know, this money come in with ease. I'm like. I was a little shocked, but I was not quick to spend any of it. I'm like, listen, all these other people can go on Amazon and, you know, whatever other websites and spend all of it. Because I know that, I mean, that's also kind of what it's... That's what it's for. That's what they want, they want you to spend. Yeah, to stimulate the economy, you know. I get it, but I'm not going to spend my money on things that are going to depreciate. If anything, I'm going to invest in some raw materials to start up my own business, you know, to create some kind of... Uh, extra income you know a new source or like really that's that's pretty much the only thing like i was just buying um, raw materials to build something of my own like my own products i wanted to like i'm thinking about buying this um low-key expensive printer because i'm a photographer too except i'm i'm more of an architectural photographer i love buildings and, and nice you know nice looking buildings and stuff so all in my house i have these large prints you can probably see one in like in here but um I enjoy large prints and so I wanted to invest in this like really great, I think it was like an Epsom or Pixma something uh, printer, you know, so I can continue doing things that I love without having this, you know, outsource and pay so much money for, you know, someone to do this one print where I can just invest, you know, this one time, you know, payment for this great investment that's going to last me years and I can produce so much more content. So I think that it, mine is more of, um, my mind is more in investing, you know, longevity. You know, that's I'm not I'm not the fashion nova shopper. I'm not, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's all about investing in yourself and betting on yourself, man. Like you said with that printer, I remember back in college coming when you're talking about the Epson. So I totally understand. So being a graphic designer, we have to do our prints. You can go to the lab and you can print for a certain amount of fee, or you can buy your own printer. So I paid like six hundred dollars for a printer that I. I'm like I cannot afford this, but I have to go ahead and do this because I'm tired of spending. So you buy the printer. I still have that printer to this day, and it still works just fine. You know, you can print 11, 17s, you can print quality. You know, you can just quality prints that you can print because you don't quite get that when you're outsourcing. So when you're doing it by hand, you just love a little bit more of a an attachment to it, and it's a little bit more freedom, and you feel a little bit more better. You touch it like it's it's one thing you you just create something. And then you see it printed right in front of you, like I just did that. Is it something about that that makes you feel so much better? Like, like I created this, I did this, and then you see the print come out. It's like there's no better feeling. You know, you could create something and send it off, and then it comes back like, oh, okay, that's cool. But when you create it and you print it right there on on site, then it's just it's amazing feeling. So I, I totally get what you're saying, and things like that. So being in this, being in the, in the lockdown. I've been trying not to spend more, you know, I've been, you know, just buying, like I said, investing in myself, buying things I need, like a mic or a stand or a light or, you know, just whatever it takes, so, you know, software, just things and, you know, building up on your skill set so that you can, you know, prosper off your skills in the future because it's a capitalistic world and I'm not going to, you know, feel sorry for trying to make money on my skills. That's what we're here for. You, you as an adult, you continue to grow, you learn what your passion is, you, you, Get in your passion, you figure it out, and then you figure out a way how to monetize it. Like that's what it, that's what it's all about. You monetize your passion. You know, you know, some people will probably have a passion. They probably would never show it to the world. You know, that's one thing. But you know, if you're able to create something and somebody's willing to pay for it, then hey, why not? You know, that's what it's for. You it's a commerce, it's a change of goods. If I if you have something that I really enjoy, I like that photo, and you want to sell it to me. You want to charge me whatever you want to charge me as long as it's worth as much however, however much i'm willing to pay for it so if you give me the price and i say you know what uh, would you take this for and you're like no this is what it's worth this is the value that's what it is you know that's the value you put a stamp on what the value is and that's what i like about art you value your art you know the world doesn't value you put your value on it and it's up to the person to determine if it's worth that and if they're not if it's not worth it to them then it, you know it's on to the next person because the average person looks at an art piece for like three seconds you know they look at it for three seconds they determine right then that three seconds if it speaks to them or not 
if it doesn't speak to them, they go on to the next next piece of art. But if it does, they'll stand there and they'll look. And that's why I created the installation I did for the first of the year back at Trap Bar. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get outside of my comfort zone. I was just doing the photos and doing videos. And I kind of kind of got caught into the digital age, whereas when I was in college, I was doing more like painting and things like that. But I didn't have the time. And I kind of got caught just doing a lot of digital work. And I said, I want to do something different. And I was like, I want to do an installation. And I was like, how am I going to do this? You know, and you think about it, you're like, how can I, what am I going to do? And you start coming up with ideas and brainstorming and you're writing down ideas. And then next thing you know, you know, it's one thing to think about it, but then take that extra step and actually doing it. So I was like, I start, like I said, go out and look for the materials. And I built this thing in my garage. I could never put it together. You know, I was doing it one thing at a time. I, I do this, I do this piece, I do that piece, I do that piece. And in your mind, you, you wonder how it's going to look and how people are going to receive it. So I put it all together. I took it to the trap bar, I put it out, and people were vibing, you know, they were just not even paying attention to it at first, you know, because people didn't know what it was because they had never seen it. I had just kind of put it out, and that's when you guys were having the, um, the panel. So I couldn't be there when initially, when I set it up, because I just set it up and then I ran downstairs. And I came back and I saw people just like, not doing what I thought they were going to do. You know, you have your mindset on, like when you build, when I built it, I was like, okay, they're going to interact with it this way, but then when you put it out there, it's for the public, and then they, tell you what, how they feel about it. And so they were interacting in a totally different way. And I was just standing back, just watching, just seeing the people talking and enjoying it. And that thing was up for like, I couldn't get it, I couldn't take it down. It was like 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the morning. People still just wanted to take photos with it. And I was like, wow, we really need that here. And so I've been like, should I try to put a museum for our culture? Try to do something like a museum for our culture? Yes. You know, like that, you know what I mean? Because you just saw how people just gravitated to it. People were, and, then, and it was the line was so long just to get to it. And I'm like, I did this in my I did this in my garage in two weeks. Imagine if I really put some effort into this and like really thought out and you know brought some people in and put and got the vision much bigger. Imagine how the people would really take to it. Cause I was really inspired by I saw the trap the trap museum. I haven't been to it. I actually went down to Atlanta, but I missed it by a week. They had closed. No, no, it was the two chains. Yeah, did the pop up house when it was the pink house, and I was really inspired by it. I was like, man, I got to get down there. And the week that I got down there, they took it down the day I got there, and I was just so upset. I was like, man, I was really trying to go see this thing, and then it just like kind of sparked something in me. And then the trap art museum that they had in Atlanta popped up, and I haven't been able to get to it. But you just see all the photos and everything, just inspiring, just seeing these different things and how our culture moves and how you. I'm inspired by the things I see, things I see, things I read, things I watch, you know, people, just anything, when you're artist, anything can spark an idea. Sometimes I even wake up in the middle of the night and just have an idea and I just have to get my phone out and just, you know, type it in my phone and then I can go back to sleep. And I feel better in the morning because I was like, because sometimes you have an idea and you forget about it and you try your best to try to get it back, but it just doesn't come back. So I just, whenever I have an idea, I just spill it out on my phone or I write it down on a piece of napkin at the table or whatever so what, what inspires you the most like what things like besides a book like do like what stimulates you to get you to create um I've always been an artistic person uh or just you know a, an appreciator of art uh, and I really think that you know, I kind of live by this this mantra it's like uh you are what you do not what you say you do you know, so my thing is, if I say I'm a photographer, it's because I actively take photos. If I say I'm a painter, it's because I actively paint, you know what I mean? And so I kind of just sat back and I thought about like, okay, well, who do you want to be and what do you want to do? You know, um, so I decided, you know, the only difference between me and these other artists is the fact that they're doing it and I'm not. So pick it up, you know, do it, just step mm -hmm. out. And I don't expect to be the next Picasso or Van Gogh, you know, just off the bat, you know, it definitely is a, a skill that you have to practice. And that honestly, just even starting it, I think the first thing I wanted to do is uh, draw a picture of uh, Jimi Hendrix. And just as I'm drawing, I'm like, dang, this is a little harder than I thought, <laughs> you know? So I had to give mad props to, you know, all these very, very talented other artists, you know, because what, what they produce, looks so easy you know but that ease comes with a lot of time and effort that they put into building their craft you know so um i think that's really just what it is for me is just trying to practice like it really takes that 
you know that time that focused energy to create something so that was that was my motivation 10,000 hours in come back before you got to put that 10,000 hours in you got to you got you got to master that craft and it comes with time and it's just because you pick it up doesn't mean it's going to automatically just you're going to be great at it you, the first thing that you create is never going to be your best you just have to continue to practice it and continue to grow it. And that's what with me with photography, I was self-taught, so nobody taught me how to do it. I just had to, I picked up a camera, watched a lot of YouTube, I could call it YouTube University. You watch your immersive <laughs> YouTube videos that you could possibly find. You get the camera and then you just go. You, you know, it's not gonna be good in the beginning and you're gonna learn as you go. And you're gonna get better, you're gonna learn the techniques, you know. And that's our, I think, our new way of learning. We learn through podcasts, we learn through videos, YouTube's learn from other people, whereas the traditional sitting in the classroom for eight out for four hours or you know those you know, thirty minutes, you know, it just not doesn't work no more for me. It doesn't just personally it doesn't work for me. I learn by you know getting out and messing up. So if you if I mess up something, I know okay, I know not to do that again. So I know how to do it the next time. I do. You know, and learning from other people and seeing you know people out doing like I said, people are out doing it. You go and get with those. I think that's what our one of our one of our downfalls is. We don't. We don't go out and seek the knowledge from people who are actually doing it. We'll rather stumble and stumble and stumble versus asking somebody to say, hey, how did you do that? And them giving you the, the, the shortcut to say, hey, I did it this way and take this blueprint and you go. That's why Frank, some franchises are better than others because they built up a business and then they say, hey, we got a, a sustainable business. Now let's go sell it to someone. And like say for Chick-fil-A, it's like, hey, we have this great business. Okay, let's go and open up another Chick-fil-A. And then we're gonna open up another Chick-fil-A because they do it the same way every single time. So they know that this model works and we won't tend to ask people who are doing things that are better than us. Just because one, they may be younger than us, we feel intimidated. Like, I'm not actually talking to this guy, man. He's three years, five years younger than me, but I don't care. I ask whoever, if you got the knowledge, you're doing something I wanna do, I ask a person. Some things that you know you have to go on, on your own and you kind of figure out on your own and it just takes a little bit longer not to say you won't get it but if you want to get there a little bit a little bit faster pace and sometimes you just have to ask some people so i got some questions for you. i want to do some some quick round questions for me give me the first thing that comes to your mind okay ah, okay all right talking or texting talking frosted flakes or cinnamon toast crunch Favorite junk food? Chips and salsa. Donuts or bagel? Bagel. Ah. <laughs> Favorite ice cream? Uh, strawberry shortcake or Rocky Road? Favorite muffin? Blueberry yogurt. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Difficult. If I could have God one question, why me? Mm. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving. One to ten. How hot is a shower? With ten being the hottest. Oops, eleven. <laughs> I love a hot shower. That's one. And if you could go anywhere in the world. All expenses paid, where would you go? Paris. Paris? Nice. Nice. Okay, man. I appreciate you joining the Doe Vision experience. I've been nothing but thrilled that you've come aboard and you've taken part of this. Is there anything you want to plug or you want to give your IG and things that you might be working on before we jump off? Oh, man. Uh, first and foremost, follow me on Instagram uh, at curlysb underscore. Uh, second of all, I'm very excited about Trap Art's digital magazine release. We're about to drop another uh, magazine release that's about to come out. You know, if you love what Trap Art is doing as far as the events goes, uh, this whole quarantine, we've learned to kind of pivot the business model and we're incorporating our artists and into this wonderful digital platform now. So we're still essentially doing the same thing, you know, uh, providing that platform for artists of all different backgrounds. We're just doing it digitally. And with that, we're able to span, you know, so many different avenues so um, keep your eyes out for that www.trapart.com uh, shout out to jesse and amina for the opportunity 
shout out to you for even having me on this super dope podcast. I'm very, very grateful to be a part of it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And you can always find me at Dope Vision SF on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Dope Vision SF at gmail.com. Go join the Patreon. Be a part of the club. Patreon.com forward slash Dope Vision. Oh, because you because you come on the podcast, you're not in the club. So you're definitely happy to size. I see some merch and some of the Instagram inspired by my God merch. So, you know, hopefully one day this could possibly get someone to save a life. Nobody's gonna save a life with somebody inspired by God. So that's vision, that's what I wanna put out there in the, in the universe, put positive vibes out there. So with that, I go ahead and wrap it up. Appreciate you guys and see you in the next episode.